But Pharaoh said, Who is this Lord whom I'm supposed to go, whom I'm supposed to obey by letting Israel go? I don't know this Lord, and I certainly won't let Israel go. Welcome to this service of worship. We're glad that you're with us. We have a few things to make sure that you're mindful of as we continue in worship first. Um, we continue to be in the season of Easter. And with that, we practice, we continually practice our confession of faith. Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Hallelujah. We, we also welcome to our pulpit Elder Chris McClain. He is training to become a lay pastor with our presbytery, um, but he's long been a faithful and welcome guest um, for us. And so we just welcome Chris and look forward to what he has to say. Thank you, Chris. Um, we also want to make you mindful about repetition. An important part of learning is repetition, doing something over and over and over again until we finally get the hang of it or we finally arrive at understanding. And so if you're feeling uneasy about sharing your faith, um, try practicing with someone that you trust first over and over and over again. Eventually, it will come naturally. And in so doing, we better celebrate the gift of Easter um, for us, not just in the season, but throughout our life. Also, the mission yard sale is completed, and we are just thankful and grateful. It was a great success, and we say many, many thanks um, to the great and hardworking group of people who managed three years' worth of stuff. Uh, we especially say thank you to Elder Carol Phillips and to Elder Vinda Crawford, who coordinated the entire thing. And their thoughtless, thought, <laughs> thoughtful, excuse me, and tireless leadership made the event meaningful, not just possible. So again, thank you to you very, very much. Also, homecoming was a great success, and we thank God for our church and for the many people who helped us make this great birthday celebration um, a real event. And we especially thank the life committees for working together to make all the small details count. Thank you all very, very much. Now, we continue through the season of Easter with our theme, Unravel. Um, this idea that, that sometimes things happen in our lives that, that unravel us. Um, things that, that take apart our tightly knit plans. And that sometimes God is the one doing the unraveling. We need to be unraveled in order for us to become whom God wants us to be. And so we, we continue looking at these and exploring these stories um, that help us to kind of peer into this some. Um, shame and identity, um, fear, grief, dreams, and expectations. You can yet pick up a copy of the study guide from the church office, or you can download a guide from the church website. But with those things in mind, let us take a deep breath, silence our devices, and continue in worship. So 
sing a new song to him who sits on heaven's mercy seat. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to rainbows of living color, flashes of lightning, rolls of thunder, blessing and honor, strength and glory and power be. without all of the things that conspire to make things even harder, even more unclear. Let us admit the ways our shortcomings get in the way of seeing the larger picture of God's will with us. Let us pray. Holy God, we want the road to be straight, but we run into curves. We want the skies to be clear, but the storms arrive anyway. We want the world to be a better place, but we fight to keep things as they are. Life itself is full of contradictions, and when it comes to your vision for the world, Lord, forgive us.
for being living contradictions to you. Forgive us for ignoring the reality that some of the curves and storms we experience may have come from you. With humility and gratitude, we pray. Amen. As always, thank you for listening, God. Amen. Our scripture reading comes to us from Exodus chapter 5, verses 1 through 2, and then chapter 7, verses 8 through 23. Through 23, Moses and Aaron confront Pharaoh. Listen for the word of God to us all. Afterward, Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said, This is what the Lord, Israel's God, says. Let my people go so that they can hold a festival for me in the desert. But Pharaoh said, Who is this Lord whom, I, whom I'm supposed to obey by letting Israel go? I don't know this Lord, and I certainly won't let Israel go. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, When Pharaoh says to you, Do one of your amazing acts, then say to Aaron, Take your shepherd's rod and throw it down in front of Pharaoh, and it will turn into a cobra. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and did just as the Lord commanded. Aaron threw down his shepherd's rod in front of Pharaoh and his officials, and it turned into a cobra. Then Pharaoh called together his wise men and wizards, and Egypt's religious experts did the same thing by using their secret knowledge. Each one threw down his rod, and they turned into cobras. But then Aaron's rod swallowed up each of their rods. However, Pharaoh remained stubborn. He wouldn't listen to them, just as the Lord had said. Then the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh is stubborn. He still refuses to let the people go. Go to Pharaoh in the morning as he is going out to the water. Make sure you stand at the bank of the Nile River so you will run into him. Bring along the shepherd's rod that turned into a snake. Say to him, the Lord, the Hebrews God, has sent me to, sent me to you with this message. Let my people go so that they can worship me in the desert. Up to now, you still haven't listened. This is what the Lord says. By this you will know that I am the Lord. I am now I'm now going to hit the water of the Nile River with this rod in my hand, and it will turn into blood. The fish in the Nile are going to die. The Nile will stink, and the Egyptians won't be able to drink water from the Nile. The Lord said to Moses, Say to Aaron, Take your shepherd's rod and stretch out your hand over Egypt's waters, over their rivers, their canals, their marshes, all their bodies of water, so that they turn into blood. There will be blood all over the land of Egypt, even in wooden and stone containers. Moses and Aaron did just as the Lord commanded. He raised the shepherd's rod and hit the water in the Nile in front of Pharaoh and his officials, and all the water in the Nile turned into blood. The fish in the Nile died, and the Nile began to stink, so that the Egyptians couldn't drink water from the Nile. There was blood all over the land of Egypt. But the Egyptian re religious experts did the same thing with their secret knowledge. 
As a result, Pharaoh remained stubborn, and he, and he wouldn't listen to them, just as the Lord had said. Pharaoh turned and went back to his palace. He wasn't impressed even by this. For the word of God in Scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us, thanks be to God. If I made a list of my favorite heroes from the Bible, I think Moses would make the top five for sure. I like stories about heroes, and I remember as a young person around Easter time, the uh, Ten Commandments would come on TV, and I would watch it every chance I got. So when I think of Moses, it's hard not to imagine the grim-faced Charlton Heston standing before Pharaoh and delivering a powerful, let my people go. And I'm pretty sure there are several movies about Moses now, but no matter how we might portray him or think of him, he was still just a person like you and I. Real heroes don't have to be perfect. Moses himself confessed that he couldn't speak well, and he seemed quite anxious about going to Egypt to help free Israel. And he reluctantly agreed to go with the help of his brother Aaron. This Moses I can relate to. He wasn't a hero because of any superhuman abilities or aspirations of greatness, but because God called him to follow, and he did. Most heroes in stories have an opposing force that must be dealt with, and for that, the opposition came from Pharaoh. We're told that Moses was about 80 years old at this time, but we don't know a lot about Pharaoh. His name isn't used in the Bible. His age isn't given. All we really know is just his title and what we can learn from his interactions. I get the sense that Pharaoh was a person who gave commands but did not like receiving them. He becomes in this story the embodiment of humanity's greatest weaknesses. He is haughty. He's prone to anger and retribution and resistant to change. As Moses and Aaron came before Pharaoh for the first time, in chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, Moses began by letting Pharaoh know the source of his message. These words are from the Lord, the God of Israel. Then follows the message, Let my people go so that they can hold a festival for me in the desert. Now the word let maybe conveys a softness to this message, but it was not a question directed to Pharaoh. It was a command, and this command denoted authority. It would be a little bit like a student asking a teacher to be excused from class. But instead of asking, may I be excused, the student would be saying, you will excuse me from class. It might be different now, but that's not how I got things accomplished at school or anywhere for that matter. But this is essentially God's message to Pharaoh. Right off the bat, the message is jolting and is directed at the heart of Pharaoh. Moses makes it clear that there is a greater authority than the king of Egypt, one which requires obedience. So right from the very first, from the very first words, God begins by unraveling Pharaoh's idea of authority. God's word directed through Moses was that Pharaoh was subject to the authority of God, of the God of Israel, and should be obedient. But Pharaoh does not accept and replies, Who is the Lord? who I am supposed to obey by letting Israel go. I don't know the Lord, and I certainly won't let Israel go. Pharaoh makes it clear that he does not recognize the authority of God and will not obey. Well, this response seems that things aren't going very well for Moses. God has called him, given him the tools he needs and the words to share, but Pharaoh says no. Maybe Moses was familiar enough with the Egyptian politics that he expected Pharaoh's response. And then again, maybe a part of him hoped that this would be easy. I know I would have. Often in my prayers, when I face a difficult choice or decision, I pray for a speedy resolution, an easy way out, a clear sign. But we don't often get the answers we want, when and how we desire them, do we? Moses and Aaron go before Pharaoh many more times with pretty much the same message, and for a while, all they get is rejection. Maybe they started to wonder if they were doing this right. 
maybe they had doubts. Now, I can't say what Moses and Aaron were thinking, but I can say what I would feel. I would be ready to give up. I'm not sure that I would see the point in continuing to do something that was destined to earn me rejection over and over again. But Moses and Aaron followed God's instructions. Exodus chapter 7 verses 10 and verse 20 clearly state that Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and did just as the Lord commanded. If I did exactly what I was supposed to do, then I would have hoped for better results. I think what I forget, and maybe all of us do from time to time, is that we are a bit short-sighted. Our thoughts, plans, abilities, and endurance all run out and only go so far. But it's the condition of our hearts that will see us through. Now, I've been beating around the bush a little bit, but I think the crux of this story is the condition of our hearts. Not the physical beating heart, but the force of will, the chamber filled with our desires, and the inner self that is the real us. No other person, no matter how close, can fully know the heart of another. Yet, we can see the direction a heart is pointing. The condition of your heart is revealed by your response to God. As with this story of Moses and Pharaoh, we see the condition of the heart is not just a problem for the individual, but a heart that has hardened like Pharaoh's hurts others as well. What causes a heart to become hard? I might well ask what makes us stubborn. For one, it's a condition we are born with. Have you ever watched a group of toddlers at play? Sometimes they will share and be so kind to one another that it can literally bring tears to your eyes. And other times, they can become possessive, little tyrants. We have a little chihuahua named TJ at home, and he's generally a good dog. He will greet you when you get home and sit with you and treat you like he's your best friend. And other times, especially if you give him a treat, he will become an evil, possessive monster, ready to fight you lest you take his snack. What in nature makes us this way? I think the easiest answer is that we believe on some level that there is not enough for everybody. We have to hold on to what we have, keep it for ourselves, and protect it because if we don't, it's gone. Scarcity may well have been a driving factor in Pharaoh's hard heart. It was certainly one of the reasons why Israel was forced into slavery. It's the belief that there is not enough or the belief that we don't have enough that hardens our hearts toward others. This caused unjust harm to Israel, and it has caused unjust harm to many throughout history and even today. Slavery in our own country came to be because some believed they didn't have enough. Not enough produce, not enough money, not enough time, not enough power. These desires hardened the hearts of people so they could no longer see the truth. They only saw their own justifications. Just like Pharaoh, people could only have treated other human beings in this way because hearts became hard. God as revealed to us in Scripture, is not a God of scarcity, but of abundance. When Jesus turned water into wine at the wedding in Cana, he didn't make a couple of bottles, but over a hundred gallons. When he told the disciples to cast their nets into the sea, they didn't catch a few fish, but the nets were filled to overflowing. When Jesus fed the 5,000, there was plenty for everyone, and there was baskets of leftovers. I truly believe there is and can always be enough if we stop holding on to our scarcity as the motivator for our lives. During the Great Depression, there wasn't really a shortage of food, but a shortage of customers. In order to maintain price and stock in companies, produce and animals were literally destroyed or left to rot, or thrown away. And things like this still happen today. In the balance between wealth and hunger, the scales often get tipped toward wealth. And it is unfortunate 
that in many ways we continue to see the injustices of Pharaoh perpetuated today. God's hope for the world is one of abundance. It's a challenge today to live into that dream. Those who had very little before have even less now. Our response to it is not always easy, and it's not always clear, but we can at least keep our eyes open to see and not pass by those in need. Another symptom of a hard heart is pride or arrogance. Pharaoh exhibits quite a lot of this in his interactions with Moses and Aaron. He seems to think quite highly of himself and his abilities. When Moses and Aaron go back before Pharaoh, they are asked to perform some feat of power. Pharaoh wanted to see for himself if this God of the Israelites was anything to be concerned about. Well, God, through Moses, does not disappoint. The rod was thrown down, and it becomes a snake. Pharaoh calls for his experts, and they too throw down their rods, which become snakes. I can't help but notice here that Pharaoh doesn't get a counter to the snake from Aaron's rod, but instead gets more snakes. I don't know about you, but one snake is one snake too many. But now they have a bunch of snakes wriggling around. It was sheer chaos. Pharaoh only makes the problem worse. But the snake from Aaron's rod cleans up the mess and swallows the others up. Now, this was not an insignificant message to Pharaoh. Once again, God is showing Pharaoh who is in charge, yet Pharaoh seems to find satisfaction in his own strength and his own abilities and the abilities of his experts. And so, once again, he denies Moses' request, yet Pharaoh's plans, I believe, are beginning to unravel. At this point, I'm sure his experts noticed that they no longer had their staffs, and perhaps they began to consider what this might mean. The next visit of Moses and Aaron to Pharaoh is, in my opinion, one of the worst things to happen, and one of the most telling about Pharaoh. Now, in Egypt, the Nile was life to all their people. All of their cities and communities were built along the Nile, it was the source of food and water and their primary means of travel. Moses and Aaron are told they would find Pharaoh at the Nile in the morning. So I believe that going to the Nile was apparently one of the first things Pharaoh did because it was that important to their livelihood and survival. And this is where God meets him. Now Moses is given a similar message for Pharaoh. But with the addition of the phrase, up until now, you haven't listened. God wasn't just acknowledging Pharaoh's lack of response, but was letting him know that it did not go unnoticed. The up until now statement carries with it the meaning that Pharaoh was going to listen. Moses then told Pharaoh what was going to happen. And Aaron, following God's instructions, uses the rod that turned into a snake and turns the water of the Nile into blood. The water became undrinkable. The fish died, and the smell was horrible. Everything that was important to the life and function of Egypt was changed. The people had no clean water. They had to resort digging holes along the river to find fresh water that they could drink. They had to take fish off their menus. And travel, of course, was horrendous due to the smell. And I'm sure it was a miserable week for all of Egypt. But Pharaoh's experts step up once again, and they turn water into blood. But once again, they're only making things worse. Pharaoh seems satisfied that he has power, and he will not listen he would not acknowledge God's word to him. Pharaoh's arrogance has indeed deceived him. The, the prophet Obadiah, in his message to the Edomites, 
struck at the heart of this matter as well. Obadiah 1 and verses 3 through 4 states, Your proud heart has tricked you, you who live in the cracks of the rock, whose dwelling is high above, you who say in your heart, Who will bring me down to the ground? Though you soar like the eagle, though your nest is set among the stars, I will bring you down from there, says the Lord. Arrogance hardens our hearts by making us too dependent on our own strength and our own accomplishments. It turns our hearts away from God and to ourselves. It also pushes others away. Verse 23 says that Pharaoh turned and went back to his palace. He turned his back on Moses and Aaron and seemingly even his own people at that point. Pharaoh became blind to what was happening right in front of him. Life experiences can also lead to a hard heart. Pharaoh grew up in Egypt where Israel had been slaves for a long time. Perhaps the treatment of them as a people that he had experienced while he was growing up led him into callousness toward them so that he valued them only for their labor for what he knew of them. Perhaps the training he received, the things he was taught, blinded him to the truth. Maybe something bad happened along his journey in life, and he became bitter. And we cannot deny that some, if not all, these things happen today as well. Maybe even to ourselves. My dad told me one time a story about his experience when he was in elementary school. He was left-handed, and that was his dominant hand that he used for everything. And for some people, everybody believed at the time that you should be right-handed and that it was wrong to use your left hand. And my dad said that he was forced to use his right hand at school whenever he wrote and was actually punished for trying to use his left hand, even though that was the natural thing for him to do, and it was uncomfortable and unproductive to do otherwise. This is just one example of many things people believe because it's what they grew up with. It was po the popular opinion of the time. But that doesn't make it right. Clinging to something and refusing to change just because it's the popular thing to do or it is what you're taught or even the way you've always done it is a form of hard-heartedness. And that form of hard-heartedness can indeed hurt others. Pharaoh's ways also brought about hurt and destruction to his own people and many of their lives as well. So, are there any remedies for our hard-hearted maladies? Yes, I do believe so. God began unraveling our hard hearts before the world began. Through the life of Jesus, we learned what a true heart looks like. In Jesus' death, resurrection, and ascension, we are able to share in that heart and in that love as children of God. The prophet Ezekiel looked for this and shared it with Israel to give them hope. Ezekiel 36, 26 says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove your stony heart from your body and replace it with a living one. God has given us a new heart. But life still brings difficulties. It brings disappointments and heartbreak. It's full of deception. So how do we, how do we cope with all that? I think Moses did set a good example of how to keep our hearts in good condition. He talked, he listened, and he followed God. So how do we talk to God? And where do we hear God's voice? You know, some of us might say, hey, Moses heard God. He knew what, what to do because God told him. He had the burning bush. And that is how the story goes. But who says we cannot hear God today? First, we cannot hear without listening. I found that it is a lot easier to listen when it's quiet. So if I want to listen 
to and understand my favorite music or podcast, I find a quiet place. Do we make time to find a quiet place in our lives to listen to God? We can also hear God through others, most often in worship and fellowship with one another. When we gather in body or in spirit, when we have fellowship, when we share with one another the ways in which God has and is shaping our lives, we hear God's voice. When the word of God is read and faithfully taught, when music is played and songs are sung, when the Spirit nudges us inside, we hear God's voice. As we listen, we also respond. Take time for prayer and pray all the time. Be in conversation with God in whatever struggle and circumstance. Pray when you're happy and celebrating and pray when you're sad. Pray even when you don't know what to say. The Holy Spirit within you does and will make it known to God. On every occasion, talk to God. The more you do it, the easier it gets and the closer your heart is drawn in. And we should also follow. Moses listened and then did as God directed him by going to Egypt, appearing before Pharaoh and sharing God's word with him. So how will we follow? Not every person will be called to go before nations and powerful people, but we can evaluate our own lives and for the hardness that might be lurking in how we respond to God and others. We can look around us and see the injustice that is caused by humanity's hard-heartedness, and we can do what we can to help. As God was unraveling Pharaoh's plans of injustice, God was weaving through Moses and Aaron a way forward and a new life for Israel, and one day for all people, including us. Life often unravels in unexpected ways, and humanity seems to do their best at times to help that along. But God gives us a new heart and is there with us, guiding us, and directing us in all our ways through God's word and the gift of God's spirit. As we live and work and play, remember, God deals in abundance, not scarcity. When the popular or easy thing to do hurts others, be the one to change. When pride and arrogance swell up, remember in gratitude who made the world and came to rescue us.
giving is a form of gratitude because it shows that we're aware that we've been blessed and that we stand always in God's grace. So let us move beyond obligation or ritual. Let us reflect on what we have given in all our various ways, whether online, in person, in kindnesses, in money, or in time. Let us pray together. God who teaches, take these representatives of our blessings and wealth and make the world around us rich. Take us and make us gifts also, inspiring the transformation you are seeking for our world, yes, but for those right around us as well. Amen. So the Lord be with you and also with you. Let us pray together. Lord God, sometimes we forget. We forget that we don't know everything. We forget that you created us. We forget our place. Please be gentle in your reminders. Keep being patient with us, holy God. Maintain your hopes for us. We'll get there, just as you envision. But because you made us, you know very well how hard life is, how confusing. You know how confounding even our own choices can be. Help us when we waver. Help us when we have a hard time staying on the course you set for us. Help us please remain faithful, and not just to you, but to one another. Help us be reliable in our faith so that any who come to us find sanctuary with you. May anyone who comes to us find a place for prayer, for the love of God, for your grace embodied. Let there be no doubt we belong to you. We continue praying for the pandemic's end. Please make us partners in stopping the suffering of so many to the virus's effects and for the transmission rates to decline and be clear, people are yet becoming infected. Thank you for gathering us in person. Lord God, help us not to take it for granted. We still grieve the invasion of Ukraine and loss of life and those displaced from their homes and the atrocities committed. Help us not lose sight of the ongoing wars and hardships inflicted in so many places like the occupied territories, Syria, Yemen, Sudan, even in our own streets. Lord God, we now know that there's food um, that's being held up because of this war and that many people are facing the prospect of even starvation. Lord God, as efforts for peace occur, may they be earnest and not pretext. May withdrawals be permanent and not theater. Help us as a world, but especially as a nation, as a community, as we respond. Lord, we lift up those affected by the massacre in Buffalo. Come against those forces that colluded to cause one of our own young people to do such a thing, to think in such a way, and teach us how to help, how to be neighbors right here where we live. And so we pray for so many in our community who are sick, shut in, and in rehab, and in expecting procedures. We pray for those among us who've lost loved ones, even this week. We think of those on our public and private prayer lists. Lord, intervene, as only your mercies can. Help us not only reach for your hand, O oh God, help us be your hands. Hear the prayers that we lift up to you now. Thank you for believing in us. Thank you for transforming us. Thank you for teaching us even how to pray when words fail us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. 
let us say together our benediction. Even if it looks to us like God's plan, God's way isn't working, keep going. God is God, and we are not. Get up. Take heart. Jesus is still calling you. Go and be persistent. Amen. Christ bears your burdens and your fears, so even in the midst of tears, sing praises, Alleluia, 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 Alleluia.